Last week, I began a series of two sermons, two messages, on the importance of Bible truth. You may have noticed this morning in the reading that I gave from 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, that this word truth figures rather prominently in the passage. We notice in verse 10 that that Paul mentions that there are those who perish because they refused to love the truth and to be saved. He mentions in verse 12 that those will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Because they would not believe the truth, Paul says, they delighted in wickedness, in sin, in unrighteousness. And then in verse 13, he says, we, thank, we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief of the truth. So within that passage, just in a short span of verses, we have this word truth mentioned three times. And in contrast to God's truth, he speaks of a power of lawlessness and deceitfulness that is now at work. And he speaks of those who will believe the lie. They will believe the lie, he says, because they did not love the truth. They refused, he says, to love the truth. And so we have a contrast in this passage between truth on the one hand and deceitfulness, lying, and unrighteousness on the other hand. This passage alone would show the importance of Bible truth. If we had only these words of Paul, we would know that truth is important. It is essential. And in fact, he says that we were saved by believing the truth and by the sanctifying work, that is the setting apart work of God's Holy Spirit, working in our lives because we have believed Jesus. We have received him into our lives, Paul is saying. And therefore, God is saving us, he says, through that sanctifying work of the Spirit and that belief of the truth. A great deal of money is being spent today and a great deal of effort to find out truth, to know what is truth. And of course, truth, as we might define it, is what is real, ultimately. What squares with what is actually the facts. What are the facts? And of course, all of us want to know the facts if we want to know the truth. What is reality? What is the truth of our existence? What is the truth of this universe? What is the truth regarding the future? And what is the truth that will bring us life and peace and hope and liberty? All of these things are very closely related to this concept of the truth. As we look at the ministry of our Lord, we notice that he too stressed the importance of the truth. We turn to this famous eighth chapter of John's Gospel. I'd like to begin reading in the 30th verse. We read that Jesus was teaching the people as he always did, and we read in verse 30 that as he spoke, many put their faith in him. Those who were listening to Jesus, who heard what he had to say, Many of these people, as they listened to him, decided that he was right. They decided to put their faith in him. They decided to trust him, to believe what he was saying. And then we read in verse 31 something very interesting. 
To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then, notice, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now these verses are very famous, and I'm sure all of us have heard these verses many times. It's interesting, however, to have analyzed the context in which those verses were spoken by Jesus. Some of his hearers had just decided to believe in him. Great. But notice what he says to these believers. He said, if you continue, if you hold, if you continue in my teachings, then he says, you are really my disciples. And then he says as well, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus is in effect saying, my teachings are those which can give you the truth. If you believe and continue to go on in my teachings, then you will know the truth. Then you will know the truth. And the result will be that the truth will make you free. There are all kinds of systems of doctrine, of ideas in this world. Many of them, probably all of them in one way or another, promising liberty, freedom, hope, fulfillment, and whatever else is desirable to those who follow them. Many times we've thought about the fact that communism, for example, promised a utopia, a new world. Marxism promised its followers a great society where everybody would be equal and all would share and share alike. It sounded wonderful, didn't it? The tragedy is that that system, like many other systems, has failed. It's failed because ultimately it is not the truth. It is not based on the truth. In fact, when communism became an accepted governmental way of life as it was in the Soviet Union and other countries, the communists announced to the world that atheism, the denial of God's existence and the and Christ's salvation and the truth of this book, the Bible, was that which would ultimately free mankind, but which in fact ultimately related, re, uh, resulted in the greatest bondage that men have ever seen. And we see how that is now coming apart at the seams after a generation or two of that kind of thing. We are told that at this present time, after 40 years or more of atheism being taught, the Russian people are now crying out for Bibles because they realize, many of them, millions of them realize that they were lied to when they were told that there was no God and that there was no Christ and that there was no hope beyond the grave. And so they're hungry for scripture. Millions of Bibles are being printed at this moment to be distributed to people who have been basically without the Bible for several generations. Because they found that what was so loudly parroted to be the truth turned out to be a great lie, one of the worst lies ever told. Jesus says, though, on the other hand, that if we follow his teachings, we'll know the truth. Now, either Jesus told the truth when he said that, or he was the most presumptuous imposter who ever lived. How could one man say that my teachings are the ultimate truth, and to know and follow those teachings will give you true freedom? unless either he was telling the truth in saying that, 
or he was the worst imposter who ever lived. But millions of people from that day to this have joyfully and gladly said he told the truth. We have found freedom and joy and hope and liberty in Jesus and in his teachings. One time Jesus had an interview with a woman who happened to be a Samaritan woman. She was a woman who was a member of a people that the Jews despised. And they, in their turn, despised the Jews. They lived as neighbors. The Samaritans lived between Galilee, where Jesus was brought up, and Jerusalem, where he did much of his ministry. There was this little area called Samaria. And the Samaritans lived there, sandwiched in between Jews on the north and Jews on the south in the Holy Land. We read that the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. So Jesus is passing through their territory. He sits down alongside a well. A woman of Samaria comes to draw water. She was very surprised when Jesus spoke up to her. He knew, she knew he was a Jew. He was dressed like a Jew. The Jews wore a specific type of garments, and the Samaritans had their particular way of dressing. That was very common in the ancient world and still is in parts of the world today. You are recognized by what you wear because each group within a certain society wears a certain type of clothing. So she recognized Jesus as a Jew. Suddenly he speaks up and says, May I have a drink? We're told that she was very surprised that he would ask her for a drink, she being a Samaritan. And in verse 9 of chapter 4 of John, she says, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans, we're told. And then, to top that off, when Jesus comes, or his disciples come back because they left him alone there, it says they were surprised to find him talking to a woman. Because in that culture, a man did not normally speak to a woman alone that way. It, it was thought to be rude. And she a Samaritan at that. And then Jesus goes on, before the disciples arrive though, he says to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. What, where can you get this living water? She misunderstood what he was saying, didn't she? She thought he was talking about literal water from the well. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well? and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds. This particular well was one that Jacob had dug. It had gone way back into antiquity. It's probably about 2,000 years old almost by that time. That well had been there all that time. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The water that Jesus is talking about, obviously, is not literal water, is it? He's talking about something far better than literal water. Something that will satisfy not physical thirst, which has to be satisfied time after time each day. But that will satisfy our spiritual thirst, that thirst that we have for inward reality and life and e eternal life even. So then the woman says, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Again, she's still not quite getting what he's having to say. Then I'm, I'm going to skip on down a little further <clears throat> to verse 19. So the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. 
our fathers worshiped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. The Samaritans had a temple there on Mount Gerizim in Samaria. And they worshiped God there. So she said, we worship, our, worship God on this mountain. But you Jews claim that we've got to go to Jerusalem to worship where the temple in Jerusalem is. Please notice his reply very carefully. Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. Excuse me. For salvation is from the Jews. Salvation is from the Jews. Up to this point in time, all knowledge about God, the true God, was found in the Old Testament, which is part of this book. It had been given to the Jewish people, to the Hebrew people, to the Israelite people. They had the revelation of God alone among all the nations of the world. Paul says in Romans, to them were committed the oracles of God. They were the ones who knew God. They had the worship of God. But notice there's a change coming, verse 21. He says, a time is coming, verse 23, and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, <coughs> and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so it's not going to be a matter, says Jesus, of worshiping God here in Samaria, at the temple in Samaria. It's not going to be a matter of worshiping God over here in Jerusalem, at the temple in Jerusalem. That is no longer going to be the criterion of true worship, says Jesus. <coughs> He says the time is coming and has even now come, because Jesus was there present, when those who truly worship God, doesn't matter where they are, doesn't matter who they are, they don't have to be Samaritans, they don't have to be Jews. They can be from any nation under heaven. They can live anywhere they need to live or want to live. Doesn't matter. Jesus says that the kind of worshipers that the Father wants are those who worship him in spirit and in truth. They worship him with, an in, with their whole being, in their spirit. It's not simply an outward thing. You could go in the temple and you could go through certain prescribed forms. You could offer certain sacrifices and the Jews had certain prayers that you could say and all of that was part of the ritual that you could go through. You could do the same in Samaria. They had all the stated prayers, the times to stand, the times to sit, the times to say certain words, and the sacrifices that you would offer. They had all of that. But Jesus says something more than that is needed. There needs to be a worship that comes from inside that comes from in the heart, the spirit, and that is carried out in truth. In truth. That's the kind of worship, Jesus says, that God is seeking. Does God seek to be worshipped? Jesus says he does. He says the Father is seeking this kind of worshiper. God is looking out, apparently, upon this mass of humanity that dwells on this planet. One scripture says his eyes run to and fro throughout the earth, seeking him who will serve him. That's in the Old Testament. 
God is looking out. He's looking at our congregation right now. And he is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Whose worship is real. It's an inward reality according to truth. Not simply an outward motion that we go through. <clears throat> this material in John is so important. Both here in John 4 and what we read in John 8 where Jesus said that the truth would set us free. One time Pilate asked Jesus a very important question. It's interesting that Jesus didn't say much at that time. This is found in the 18th chapter of John in <clears throat> verses 37 and 38. When Jesus was before Pilate, and he had just told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. This is verse 36. But now my kingdom is from another place. Now. Right now. Didn't say what it would be in the future, but right now. It's not from here, he says. You are a king then, said Pilate. Are you a king? You are a king. Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're saying? Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. He admits it. To Pilate, the Roman governor, the man authorized by Caesar, the emperor of the world, for Rome was the, essentially the world of its day, Pilate is the man in charge. He says to this lowly Galilean, as far as Pilate was concerned, that's all he is. You're a king then. You hear the sarcasm in his voice? Well, imagine that. Jesus says, you're right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. There's again one of those amazing sayings of Jesus. Everyone who is on the side of truth listens to me. If you don't listen to Jesus, says Jesus, you're not on the side of truth. And then Pilate asks this question, what is truth? What is truth? That's a question that the philosophers had been asking for centuries before Pilate was ever born. Pilate probably learned that question from the philosophers. He was an educated man. What is truth? We are asking that question today, aren't we? What is true? But Jesus had, in effect, answered it where he said that he came into the world to testify to the truth, to bear witness to it to give it out to the world. And he says then, one of those tremendously exclusive sayings, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. He had said something like that, very similar to that, to his disciples in private earlier. In the 14th chapter of John, <clears throat> where... Thomas had said to Jesus in verse 5, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Nobody gets to God, says Jesus, unless he goes through me. I'm the go-between. Later on, Paul calls him the mediator. There is one God and one mediator, he says, between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now, a lot of people are offended by that. Some countries won't even let Christian missionaries in because they say, we will not tolerate the idea that your Jesus is the only way that men can get to God, that human beings can get into God's favor and presence. We cannot 
tolerate that idea. And so there are entire countries that are closed to any kind of missionary work. Why do you think Saudi Arabia will not allow Christian missionaries there? And while they were very concerned about all the Bibles that got in there during the recent war, there were thousands and thousands of Bibles that got into Saudi Arabia to the servicemen over there and women, a land where no Bibles have been permitted for centuries. They wouldn't allow it. Why should they allow that? Because to them, there is only one other way, or there's only one way to get to Allah, and that's through Muhammad. That's right. That's what they believe. Muhammad, Muhammad is God's prophet. And if you do not accept Muhammad and the Quran, you're not going to get to God in the Muslim view. So here are two mutually exclusive truth givers, either Muhammad or Jesus. Which one do you choose? I suppose if you're a Muslim, you will choose Muhammad. They have for centuries. <clears throat> I happen to believe, and I hope you do, that Jesus was telling the truth when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes unto the Father but by me. Again in this wonderful Gospel of John, the 17th chapter and the 17th verse, Jesus is praying here. He's praying not only for his apostles, but he's praying for all who will believe on him through their teachings. That would include you and me too. In verse 17 he says to his Father, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. This word sanctify is a word we don't use very much in our common daily vocabulary. The word sanctify means to set apart, to set apart from other concerns or other people, to set apart separately. Jesus asks his Father to sanctify his people to set them apart by the truth. The truth. The truth of God's word sets you apart from those who do not believe the truth, who do not walk according to the truth. It sets you apart from others. And then he adds to that, your word is truth. Your word is truth. There it is. It's in here. This book is God's word. This book is the word of God for us, for you and me today. Jesus is not visibly present here. The apostles have all died. Maybe the ones who taught us the truth and who baptized us are dead. In my case, he the minister who taught me and baptized me has been asleep for several years in death. That doesn't matter. <clears throat> the word of God goes on through century after century. The truth of God continues. And people are finding salvation and liberty that Jesus talked about, freedom from sin, freedom from fear, freedom from their emotional hang-ups, if they believe and act upon what Jesus taught, what he taught. And so he could say, if you hold the teachings that I am giving you, then are you my disciples indeed. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It is therefore vitally important for each of us who has claimed to accept Jesus that we know this word. It's important for us to take time 
In our daily life, our daily schedule, we're all busy, I know. But it's important for us to take time to know this word better, to know what Jesus said, to hide those words in our hearts. Remember the psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Are we hiding it there? Are we believing it? Are we reading it? Are we studying it? Are we sharing it with others? What will we say when we stand before him in that day if we have not taken time? Along with the other truths that we've learned of how to live in this world, how to make a living, how to do our job, all the rest that's important, yes. But have we taken time to learn the most important truths of all, the truth of God's holy book, the true message of his Son, the truth which gives us eternal life and which sets us free indeed. And if the Son make you free, said Jesus, ye shall be free indeed. Free indeed. Remember Martin Luther King said, free at last? Well, I tell you a better freedom even than that. Free indeed in Jesus Christ. Praise God. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for Jesus, the rock, upon whom this church is built, the rock of salvation. We thank you, Father, that he is the way and the truth and the life, that we can approach unto you through him, that we can find great liberty and peace through his teachings, through his words. Help us, Father, not only to know his words, to study them, but also to do them, to experience their power, their reality, their truth. Father, help us to realize in the deepest part of our being what that truth is and how it liberates us from all bondage. And Father, we pray that we may be a people of truth, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth, and that you will find that we are the kind of worshipers that you want, that you are looking for. And may you find that in us through your grace, through your love. And now, Father, as we depart from this service, Go with us through the further activity of this day and of this week. Help us to share what truth we already know with those about us so that they too can find freedom and hope and life in your truth, in your Son. In his name we pray. Amen.